Ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Richard Grannon and Friends. I'm joined here today by Professor Edward Dutton, and we're going to have a little bit of a chat about what Ed has been up to and what he's into. Edward. Hello again. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. It's, uh, it's, uh, we, we keep running into each other. <laughs> uh, we, we, we ran into each other in Liverpool. Yes. Uh, which was good fun. Yes. Your, your home turf. Yes. Your, uh, well, that's, that's uh, the world, but wasn't it? That's the posh bit. It's close enough. But, 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 <laughs> but, 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 but the less posh bit. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, now, and now we're in, uh, I'm not actually sure where we are, but it's uh, somewhere in southern Spain anyway. Somewhere in southern I was Spain. I sort of abducted and brought here. This is, this is the nicest location I've ever done in it's pretty, it's pretty It's pretty impressive, isn't it? I, yeah. I, I, don't know, I assume one of the cameras is pointing over there. But um, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty impressive view. This is the most impressive view I've ever done for an interview. This is certainly more impressive than the cellar where I normally do stuff. Yes. Like that's just a wall, black <laughs> screen. This is, this is like, you know, this is real life. This is, this is beauty. So okay. yeah, it's a bit, bit, of, bit of sun as well. Um, where are you from originally, Ed? Originally from um, Wimbledon, um, so just sort of the area around there, yeah. And and uh, yeah, so the sort of this is the sort of no man's land, really. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of Surrey London border. Yes. Where where if you if you say you're from London, then people that are from I don't know in in, in a London, so well, it's not really London, is it? Yeah. And then if you say well you're from Surrey, then people that are from I don't know Guildford or something, so well, it's not really Surrey, is it? Um, and, and so you're, you're kind of in this no man's land between the two. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm. The, the borderlands. The borderlands. Do you, do you usually say sorry or London? I would people? say I just say I used to say London. when I started at university. I, um, I think I just said London. Yeah. And then they of course say where. Yeah. And then it's uh, it's an area we wasn't no one's heard of. So I I just say eventually I just started saying Wimbledon, and then that was people have heard of that. Almost everyone's internationally heard yes. of Wimbledon. Yes. So to that, an to an ignorant northerner, Wimbledon is absolutely London. But you know I'm not gonna. Get into a fight well, with any cockneys. Parts of it are, and then yeah. parts of it are were only only became London in like the early sixties. Right. So that and that's where I'm from. Right. So so it's uh, it's right on the border. Yeah. So your did you spend all of your childhood in Wimbledon? Yep. Yep. From until what age were you? Well, in? I was born in. Well, no, I was born in uh, Tooting. Mm -hmm. I was in, um, and uh, I lived until the age of two in um, Wandsworth, opposite Wandsworth Common in Flower. Mm -hmm. And then that's what I think that's like my first memory actually. My, was, is moving to the house. Yeah. Um, and my mum said I was just two. I was yeah. just two. And she said, of course they were all excited and they were moving into a house. Yeah. All the, um, and uh, I remember that uh, that night that we yeah. moved into the house. That may well be my first certain uh, memory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then you were there up until till uh, university. Until university. Um, well, obviously, I was there in the non-term time as well. Yeah. But yeah. So then at, eight, at the eighteen, I went to up north. Up north. So you're up your way. Well, up, yeah. no, the other side of the, the, uh, the uh, yeah. Which which university is you? Durham. You know, Durham. So, yeah, north. When we first got there, I mean, it's a funny thing with the north. Though, first time I went to the north, I was eleven because I was very into history when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have a period of history that I was into at any given time. Mm -hmm. And when I was 11, that was Anglo-Saxon straight Viking times. Mm -hmm. And um, and in that, in that half term when I was 11, my parents took me to the, to York, yeah. Jorvik Center. Yes. Yeah. And then up further to Lindisfarne. Nice. And, and when we f couldn't, couldn't understand a word. Right, they were saying, and yeah. then you get you get used to it very quickly. And then in Durham as well, we, me and my father were walking in this car. We go, yeah, you cannot go up there because you go up there, you're getting a problem. Yeah, the cars coming, do they? <laughs> um, and it's extraordinary how quickly you get used to it. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a friend of mine who who lives up in Durham. I'm actually going to go and see him next weekend. When you were into history as a kid, mm. did you follow? Um, History in a linear fashion, or did you bounce around? To oh, I bounced part? around. I bounced yeah. around. So I think I was when I was um, nine. I was Norman Conquest, great. And then when I was ten, I got I was into Tudor times, mm. and it was very useful that the uh, Hampton Court Palace was quite near where we lived. Yeah, and we could go there. We, like, we joined English Heritage, and we could go to, you know, every, every so often. You go to a uh, castle or whatever. So I've been to loads of the castles and palaces and whatever in the UK around mm. that age, early nineties, and then. Um, and this is before they were full of tourists. Yeah. I mean, in those days, I'm talking 1991, summer, yeah. you could go to Windsor Castle. Mm. And I, if I remember correctly, A, you didn't queue to get in. Yeah. And B, it was free. Right. And, and uh, now, when I was last in Windsor, which was 2018, I was there mm. researching for a book on mm. um, Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. headmaster. Mm. And it was a queue down the street yes. and round the corner. Yes. Of, Japanese of, of Chinese people and Russians <laughs> uh, inspired by the royal wedding 
yeah. and, and, and whatever else. And, and yeah. there was and there was the, those horrible touristy shops that you used to only get in London yeah. that sell tack and Edinburgh that yeah. sell tack, mm. and I, and I have now migrated yeah. or have expanded to Windsor. So it, it was so yeah, it was that. And then yeah, I bounce around different periods, but it was I was I was never into the 18th century for some reason. I only got into the 18th century when I was a teenager. What was it about history that fascinated you when you were It was fascinating. It was just a sort of psycho history, the idea of being there at Hampton Court Palace and thinking that uh, you know, you're from some terraced house of Wimbledon and there you are standing where the kings and queens of the country have, have, have walked around and mm. all this, there's all this, there's the, the, the glow of history between these cobbles. You know, there was mm. just something all this, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say spiritual, but there was just some, some, something quite numinous and fascinating about it. And so I was always, um, I'm into, into, into history. I've always enjoyed going to uh, historical uh, places for that reason, just that sense that you're almost part of something, that the shadows of something deeper are there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost poetic. Mm. Uh, and so I, I was always into a different period of history. My Lego would reflect it. So, so I, if, if it was the way you could make Anglo-Saxon Lego, mm. by the way, or, or Tudor Lego actually, mm. was to mix. Because in those days there was only there was the, there was the big three. Mm. There was space Lego. Mm. Uh, there was Danish normal town Lego, and there was medieval Lego, the big three. Yeah. And then now there's all this Harry Potter Lego. God, they don't have to be creative anymore. Yeah. And they brought in pirate Lego in about 1990. Right. And if you mix them together, you see, be yeah. creative. Then you can you can make different periods like Anglo-Saxon Lego or, or or Tudor Lego or whatever. You can make it look the way it should yeah, look. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you've got to think, you've got to be creative. Whereas now they don't have to be creative. It's just okay, let's just play Harry Potter. So you uh, you as a child you were experiencing and enjoying history through uh, subjectively putting yourself in that time and thinking, what would it be like, and imagining yeah. that you were living in that. But time. obviously, it was a sort of sanitized version of it. You know, you have yeah. no understanding of when you're ten years old that the child mortality rate is fifty percent. Right or uh, the, 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 they're dying very young of uh, whatever tuberculosis or something yeah. like that. Like that wasn't part of my games. Right, uh, we didn't know about that. Yeah. So, so it was a very sad. Like same with my grandfather. Uh, I assume you have a grandfather that fought in the war. Mm -hmm. So did I. Yeah. And he would always tell me these war, war stories. You know, look, I yeah. look forward when when, my, when he came to tell me war stories. He always he'd sanitize them. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm except well, there were some. As I got older, he'd say, he'd, he'd just talk about it and sanitize it less. Like I remember him saying. That he in Greece and he arrived in during the Civil War and there'd just been a massacre mm. and he said and there were these people there was these people there was these, uh, these dead bodies all over the road mm. you know what they look like they look you know like hedgehogs when they're on the street they've been run over mm. they look like that wow and uh, yeah yeah very matter of fact about it so how important is um, is history to you today well it's yeah I I I don't particularly like reading things like novels mm. well, I I only like reading novels. In so much as you can, if they're reasonably old, mm. then you're you're seeing them as almost their historical sources. They're a window into how people thought at that time, mm. or how people felt at that time, or how people spoke at that time, mm. uh, and so on. I, I'm I'm not I, I don't I wouldn't really read a contemporary novel. It doesn't interest me. No, I'd I'd, I'd much rather um, a, a, as a to to re I do all this reading on psychology and the stuff that relates to my research, mm. and so I wanted to read something on the plane to kind of. Uh, relax, mm. then I would probably read a, his a, a book about some area of history that I don't know much about. Like, yeah. for example, I was reading about the Moorish history of Spain on the way here. Which is pretty, that's pretty it's interesting. interesting yeah. 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 The, uh, one of the, I, I didn't enjoy history growing up, um, and I, nobody taught me to take it as something that you could use your imagination to imagine being in that scenario. And there's a Bob Hoskins audio book where he is talking as though he was a soldier at Agincourt. Um, and describing the slaughter of the French knights at Agincourt. And mm -hmm. I think I was 18 when I first, I was already at the end of my school career, and I was like, oh, this is how you can experience history. Mm. And it re that that was what And then genealogy me became interesting as well. Mm. So I had an ancestor, well, like a brother of an ancestor who mm -hmm. fought at Agincourt. Oh, did you? Right, so 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 then you're, you've almost got like a personal connection right. to these these kinds of these kinds of people. So then yes. genealogy can become quite interesting as well. Yes, okay. yeah. Um, what did you study at Durham? A theology. Theology. I well, I was doing my A levels, <laughs> and I did I did I did English history and Christian theology, mm -hmm. and I always thought I'd do an English degree or a history degree, mm. and then for some reason I found something so fascinating. I don't know why, but at sixteen, about about the philosophy of religion, for example, mm. um, and this kind of stuff, that I started thinking, oh, well, I'll do a theology degree, and then and then I found that. 
it was much it's much easier to get into a good university to read theology anyway than to read English or history. It's less sure. repetitive. Yeah. So um, and so um, yeah, then it became a, a, theo a theology degree. So that's why. I'd... Did you enjoy the degree? Um, mm. Well, I think I enjoyed bits of it. Mm. Uh, like looking, I think a lot of it depended on whether how good the lecturer was. Sure. So in the first year, I had a lecturer. Sorry if you're watching, but you know he he was boring. <laughs> and so, and he's my Old Testament lecturer. So I didn't yeah. like Old Testament. Yeah. And then in my second and third, second year, I had a, a lecturers in Old Testament that were so scintillatingly brilliant yeah. that they kind of charismatically made me interested in Old Testament. Right. And so in the third year, because we do theology, the compulsory modules are New Testament, Old Testament, um, systematic theology, and church history. And then you then you have a two more that you can just select. Which I um, and in the, in the third year you you do your dissertation two modules and then you can just do whatever four modules you like mm. and I may needed Old Testament because I was so fascinated. Is that the big thing was the lecturer? Like mm. in my first year, for example, I had a really good New Testament lecturer, so mm -hmm. I was really into New Testament, mm. hated Old Testament. Mm. And then in my second year, I'm sorry, but he was just it was this it was I mean he was a lovely man, but dull, but dull I'm afraid. And <laughs> and and so and so I just turned off New Testament and that's a, a big part of it. I think if you if you're charismatic and you're and you're, um, you're, you're really into your subject and whatever, then you can kind of spread that, like kind of like a contagion, but in a good way, mm. uh, to other people. And that's much more important than really any other factor. So yeah. I enjoyed elements of it yeah. if I had a, a, a charismatic lecturer who was absolutely fascinated by his subject. Yeah. When you were um, 16 and you were looking at uh, religious philosophy and theology, what was it that fascinated you about that? Well, I, I guess at that age, when you're 16 mm. and you're a bit of a twat and so you, and you're and you're nihilistic and it's these <laughs> fundamental questions of you know does god exist or whatever yeah and i was like well of course god doesn't exist obviously right. not mm. so 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 um why on earth do people believe in god mm. and then there were these arguments for the existence of god and arguments mm. against it and all this and i found this quite fascinating you see and 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 uh, so it, it was that that the, the the fundamental questions of life and at 16 you have this ridiculous nihilistic sort of worldview whereby you know I, I, I've I've I uh, other people have sunk you know down to the, the bottom of the lake of life but they've got stuck on a sort of ridge here but I'm going down to the real depths the right. darkness you know <laughs> atheism and nihilism which is probably how work people feel now to be honest but I think basically these people are perpetual 16 year olds <laughs> right? they've, they've never quite got over being sick they're just stuck they're stuck psychologically being a petulant 16 year old. It's just like, everything's so fucking unfair. It's so unfair, I hate you, I hate you. So unlike Kevin from Harry Enfield and yeah, Chums. Yeah. I hate you, so unfair. <laughs> Why do you believe in golf for, idiot? <laughs> right? and, and, and I think that that, that's what you're like then. Yeah. And, and there's, to, to, there's something quite attractive. And also, I think as well, I was at a, um, uh, perhaps, I was at a Roman Catholic school. So mm. in those days, like, well, the best schools in the area yeah. are Catholic, Catholic yeah. religious schools anyway. Yeah. And um, my mum was a, happened to be a teacher at this Catholic school. So mm. it's quite, I was able to get in. I'm not, we're not Catholic, but I was able mm. to get in on that basis. Yeah. Uh, and so you're surrounded by all this uh, religiosity. And so you kind of rebel against it. Although, although I subsequently discovered when I went to university that, that there was a, a very different kind of religiosity. There was this fundamentalist Protestantism, you see. Mm. And that's what I got fascinated by. I mean, this Catholicism, all it was, was that in the morning there'd be a bit of the prayer. Mm. And that's not, talk, like, not like a gay prayer where you talk about your feelings or whatever. Mm. It's just like the richer words, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, whatever. Yeah. And then Irish, a lot of Irish teachers. Yeah. Um, I, from a historical perspective, I was given the very much the, the Catholic, when we did, we did the, the Northern Ireland conflict um, mm. as part of, GCSE history, and I, I was, and my history teacher was a member of Opus Dei. Wow! Right, and he was from Salford and a Catholic Irish background, mm. and so I was very much given the Irish perspective. Mm. And looking back on it, I have quite a really quite a positive view mm. of Catholicism mm. uh, uh, because of that. They weren't dogmatic or anything. You just had to go to mass every so often. Yeah. So, but of course, you rebel against it, yeah. and so you're oh, an atheist or whatever. And so, therefore, religion becomes fascinating because you're surrounded by these very these religious people, at least these ritualistically religious people. Mm. And so, you think, well, what's going on? What, what is the nature of their mind? Um, so that's one of the reasons I was attracted to it. But they were very laid back, though. I don't know. I mean, they were. So you've got these people that, on the one hand, mm. we can't celebrate Red Nose Day at school because Red Nose Day are giving money to an abortion charity. Mm -hmm. So that's out. Mm. But on the other hand, they're perfectly happy to book the sick form, uh, some who are aged between 16 and 18, mm. some club, mm. and, if the, and make sure that the 16 year olds are served booze mm -hmm. such that they get catalytic. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. 
Yeah. So it was, it was, and, and there were three, there was a girls' school and a boys' school mm -hmm. um, and that were mixed in the sixth form. Mm -hmm. There were three priests at each school, mm -hmm. right? And only one mm -hmm. of those priests mm -hmm. was ever convicted for paedophilia. Only one. And not, 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 not six, <laughs> like people stereotypically think. Just one. Just the one. So that's, one in six. That's negative. That's fewer than, that's fewer than 20%. No. Right. Yeah. I mean, is. what's that? Yeah. You know, that's only, yeah. that's only, I mean, so. So, you know, yeah. you've got to take the rough with the rough <laughs> What um, uh, uh, what I was thinking is you 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 weren't a fan of religion, but you chose theology because to want... understand the why understand its nature. What, what it, we were at that time anyway. I mean, I think less so now. But uh, twenty years ago, or when I was a kid anyway, mm. we were at the fag end of a conservative Christian society. Yeah, and so Christianity was still central. Yeah. to a, a lot of what was going on. And the, we had an older generation of all dead now, born in the mm. 20s and 30s, mm. all of whom were, most of all of whom believed in God and were in mm. Church of England and or Catholic or whatever. Uh, and so it was very, very significant to, the, to, to what we were experiencing in a way that it's perhaps not so much people that are 20 years younger than me. Mm. And so it was, it, it was, that was fascinating. It was the central, central thing. Uh, and so I think that was one of the many attractions to theology. It, it denotes a certain antagonism, though, within you that you were not, you didn't, you didn't believe in theology. You were a diehard nihilistic atheist, and you're like, I'm going to go into the enemy camp and study what they think. But I think if you're a diehard nihilistic atheist, then on some level, perhaps, precisely because you're diehard, mm. you have doubts. Right. And uh, that's almost what the diehard is. That the, the person that is so pronounced and fervent in their atheism that, that I mean, my nickname when I was at university was atheist air. Mm. I was like an evangelical atheist, mm. and such a person probably has doubts. Yeah, and so um, which I did, um, and and so you're, you're creating a, a, an identity, and so uh, uh, and, and so therefore it's fascinating for that reason as well. So there's this there's this love hate relationship, or what I don't know, that's too simplistic, but there's but there's this tension. Yeah, uh, which which makes you uh, attracted to exploring it. Would you still call yourself an atheist now? Yeah, I mean, I believe in God sometimes. That's the honest truth. When it, when it's a good day, do you believe in God? Or? Probably one of its bad day. If it's a bad I, day, like now, not so much. There's nothing really, yeah. you know. But, but I imagine that if uh, uh, if, a, if if a nuclear bomb suddenly hits, someone, I can imagine. You know, start praying. Yeah, start. Yeah, I mean, we have to be, let's be honest about that. I need it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He suddenly, he suddenly. He suddenly comes back, you know, like an elderly maiden aunt who doesn't really like to talk about sex or, or anything interesting, but she's there when you need her, you know. Like, um, so, so, uh, yeah. Do you believe in God? Uh, I, I, I can't believe naively in God. I can't. I can't do it. I've tried. I think my life would be easier. And we know uh, from the research, don't we, that that there is there are benefits uh, mm. to a religious belief. But naively believing in some all-powerful being is just uh, there's no data for that supports that. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a it's a cognitive bias that yeah. some, that, some, that seems to be quite strongly heritable actually, or maybe even as much as 0.7 heritable religious okay. experience anyway, uh, which which some people have more and some people have less of, but which is clearly adaptive. Um, that, that if you if you have a homunculus on your shoulder telling you to be well behaved, then you're less likely to be cast out by the band of kills that's mm. selected for. Uh, it reduces stress. Um, and also it, 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 it hits in at times of stress and thus reduces stress. So it's a useful adaptation to have. Cultures that are more religious are generally stronger and more cohesive as well, aren't they? Mm. Mm. So I was watching a Dawkins interview the other day. Um, I, I can't remember who with. Uh, and he was he said something that hurt my feelings. He said, People who think that everyone else should be religious, but they don't need to be. That's a patronizing point of view. But that is literally my point of view. I think religion and belief in God is necessary. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. But I think for, for a culture, for a society, it's better if people believe in God. Uh, yes. I mean, it's uh, the evidence is that the people are more pro-social if they believe they are being watched. Yeah. And if you genuinely believe you are being watched and mm. you are by God, then mm. uh, you, you are you are more pro-social. Um, also, belief in God tends to be wrapped up with um, everything else which is adaptive, including promoting being group oriented. Right. And, and therefore and therefore the religion promotes that. Mm. Um, and then once that happens, then you start competitively signaling your group orientation. Yeah. And so you end up with a much more cohesive society and also a society that has a sense of its own eternal importance. Right. And therefore people can be induced to fight and die for that society. Mm -hmm. And so um, on, on all these and, and a society that gets together occasionally and has uni uniting um, liminal 
rituals mm. which which induce a, 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 a dissipation of a sense of self into something greater mm. and so you can see all kinds of benefits to it you know i am not a mormon mm -hmm. but i would quite happily go and live in utah where everybody else is <laughs> lovely place yes. lovely people nice people i'm yeah. not a mormon yeah I, but i've been to utah and I, i'd happily be a jack mormon right I, I, a, um, you know, a Mormon sympathizer. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not, I, I've realized as I get older, no, I want other people to be uh, religious. <laughs> and if, um, and if, if that's patronizing, I can't do anything about it. I can't, I can't do anything about it. In the, in, in the same way that I might want other people, I'm not practical and I have no desire to do any DIY. Right. But I want other people to be able to do that. So, so um, would you agree with Dawkins' criticism? So we have a similar position on this, that, that, what, that our position is kind of patronizing. Well, patronizing to whom? Who will be patronizing? <laughs> We're saying, listen, you moron peasants, you need, I don't need God. Yeah. Because I can be good without a supreme being. I can be conscientious and, and, and cohesive in groups, but you can't <laughs> because you're morons. <laughs> no, no, I'm, well, that may well be patronizing, but I think we, as we, as we get out, let, let's be frank, it's mm. quite obvious that, 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 that some people are much more intelligent than other people. Yeah. And, when, and when people are not particularly intelligent, and don't have particularly good impulse control, mm. then if they are inculcated with, with, that's why we inculcate children with religiosity. Mm. Um, if they are inculcated with these kinds of pro-social um, religious ideas, then they will behave better. Yeah. And, and, and if you take those away from them, then you just have people, uh, this, this is almost certainly why the English working class or underclass has, has utterly degenerated in the absence of religion yes. um, in, in a way that the middle class hasn't. Yes. So the, the, middle, the middle class, okay, religion has died, mm. or well, not died, but it's, it's, it's on life support. Mm. Um, and the, the people that are middle class are still um, genetically highly intelligent, mm. uh, high in conscientiousness, high in agreeableness. Mm. And so they're still getting along in life, even in the absence of religion. Yeah. If you get people that are not very intelligent, not very agreeable, not very conscientious, then in the absence of religion, they just degenerate into, into, into free-for-all chaos. So it's just, it's ridiculous to call it patronizing. It's just, it's just empirically reasonable argument. And, and, and Richard, Richard Dawkins... Um, I, I just, I don't understand how someone so manifestly intelligent as, as him can have such a blind spot when it comes to religion. The, first of all, he doesn't seem to accept that religion is an evolved cognitive bias. He thinks it's a, an accidental consequence mm. of other things that are adaptive. Mm. But that's manifestly nonsense because, because, all, because we've, we know there's a heritability to religiosity. Mm. It has all the different components of an adaptation. Mm. It's found in all cultures. It's um, uh, highly heritable. Mm. It's associated with fertility. It's associated with mental health. It's associated mm. with physical health. It's associated with group orientation. It's associated with specific parts of the brain. If you stimulate with magnets, you become more religious. Mm. Um, it's, just, it, it's an instinct that hits it at times of stress. It has mm. all of the components of of, a, of an adaptation, um, and and it's evidently um, uh, central for a society. If you want that space that mm. he wants, he wants mm. where he can do his scientific research and whatever, mm. then you need to have a society that will keep away the enemies at the gate. You need to have people that will lay down their lives mm. for the society. And religion is is and the idea of the eternal is the is very important to persuading people to do that. Um, and so I, I think Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins is. I, He's the kind of person that if you were a 16-year-old nihilist, mm. as I was, mm. then you'd think he was great, mm. as I did. Yeah. But then if you actually grow up, mm. which, which I don't think he has, um, uh, I think he's stuck somewhere. That, that's what I was going to ask you next. Do you think his, um, uh, his, his rejection, his wholesale rejection of, of, the, of religion and the necessity for religion, do you think it has like a pathological flavour to it? There's, some, there's something in there that's... Well, he's so he's so um, he's so dogmatic about. It. I think if mm. it's a bit, I mean, you've done all this therapy work with people about narcissism and whatever, and these are very these are very damaged people. Mm. Um, although they are people that, uh, at least with the vulnerable narcissist, I suppose at, at certain points they, I think I'm right. I think I would a borderline personality sort of people. Mm -hmm. um, they, they can have moments of awareness where you really can make them understand. You know? yes. but, then, but then they will flip back to the self-protection mechanism of, oh, no, I, wasn't, I didn't have a, 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 a borderline personality disorder or a psychotic episode. No, no, my, my stresses and, and, and anxieties are genuine and reasonable. Yes. But then sometimes they'll understand, no, they're not. Yes. And you're, the behavior you've just engaged in of completely devaluing me and make, say making out I'm evil. Yes. And then there's this long pause. And then you're like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. You know, th yes. That was something 
odd, yeah. weird, right? Yeah. That's no matter how much stress you're under. Mm. That's something, and they have these moments where they understand that. Oh, I wish I didn't have to do that. And if you get to know me well, you'll see that side of me. And I mm. wish I, I feel I can't have intimate relationships because they'll always see that side of me, and it'll yeah. always come back. It'll yes. always come back like some, like some slapped, belted child that, mm. that that tries to turn you into itself. Yeah rip you apart, make you feel confused and hated, right? Like that. And they can have these moments of understanding. Mm. And I think that's, um, I just think that it, it strikes me that um, of self-awareness. And if anyone is extreme like that, then often it's, an ident you're creating a strong identity mm. because you have got some hole somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so you need to create this strong sense of certainty of who you are to overcompensate for the fact that deep down there is, as you, this term, we've had trouble uh, defining mm. um, this, there is this lack in the clear sense of self, and you're mm. always self-doubting and wondering, and and so on. Mm. And that's why you create an extreme sense of identity, and right. that's what he's done. You think it's over? It's a yeah, compensation. overcompensation mm. for, on some level, a, a sense of self-doubt, a sense of not being sure where he fits into things, a, a, mm. a, a sense of a, a weak sense of self. So you create a a um, a, a, a superficially to yourself. Um, a strong sense of self, but the self doubt comes in. It's expressed in the big, in the fervor, in the, in the, in the, and that's what you see with Dawkins. Mm. And so I do think to myself, on some level, um, is he sort of, sort of stuck on some part of himself? I mean, I didn't, I didn't know the guy. I just psychoanalyze mm. him or did mm. something. But, but uh, it, as, a, as a sort of angry sixteen-year-old, or even you know, tantruming three-year-old, he's never kind of got past something. I, I watched him an interview with uh, Ricky Gervais and they were having, <clears throat> it was a joking, informal interview about atheism and about science. And the way someone like uh, Gervais or Dawkins can understand science and nature, um, it is almost religious. It's, it's, um, <clears throat> it has this religious component to it, I felt, which is fine. It's not a criticism. The way they could talk about the scope and the vastness of the universe, and in order for evolution to take place, all that genetic mutation, there's a vastness of time that is beyond human comprehension. We can't. And I was like, well, in the end, um, maybe they do have their own religiosity or their own faith that serves a function of inducing uh, awe mm. and uh, uh, gratitude um, and keeps the ego under control. I, I wondered if that was so what was so, happening. Um so what? So what do we? How, how does it keep the ego under control? Sorry, I should go back. So the, you asked me if I believe in God, and what I didn't say. Um, I'm very, I'm very convinced. I was very convinced by Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov and, and Nietzsche writing in the similar time period around the 1880s, and they must, they must have been reading each other's work, or Nietzsche must have read Dostoevsky at least. Uh, this whole God is dead. We have killed him. What are we going to do in the absence of God? What festivals and rituals will we create to absolve ourselves of guilt is, is largely what Nietzsche said. Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov said, look, we're losing God in Russia. The Orthodox Church is being worn away. Our mystics are being taken away. And they both seem to have this position that, um, roughly speaking, in human psychology, there's a hierarchy. And at the top, there should be God. And if there isn't God there, we put ourselves there. It's like the birth of broad-scale narcissism. Mm. So then God uh, is a kind of, uh, in this sense, if we're talking purely psychology, is, um, is a mechanism that holds the human ego in place and stops it dilating oh, I see too far I see in, that, in that way. Stops it worshipping itself. Yes, yes. So this idea that I think that we have at the moment that it's almost Gnostic, that if you can define yourself, and that's mm. what we're being told we can do, we say, well, like God, it says somewhere in the Bible, I am what I am, or whatever it is. I am that, I, I am. am that, I am, yeah. Mm. And so this idea that um, we can define ourselves. If I mm. say I'm a woman, I am a woman. Mm. And if I say tomorrow I'm, I'm, I'm black, I am black, although apparently mm. that's crossing a border. But, but I, I, I'm, You're not allowed I'm, to do can't that. can't do that. Yet. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> you can say you're Korean. Okay. You could self identify as Korean because that's not interfering with the grievance system. Right. But, you, but yeah, so I am a woman or I, I whatever. Yeah. Um, and. Um, and so we are almost uh, chinks of divine light mm. in a in a in an evil gnostic world of darkness, yeah. and uh, that defied ourselves. We are gods. We are gods. Mm. Uh, we are the people that built the Tower of Babel mm. and become 
like one of us. We mm. have eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and have become like one of us. We mm. are gods. Mm. Uh, but then there are these evil devil gods mm. that, that doubt that and say there's such a thing as objective truth and say that, no, no, whatever. So that's, that's they're, they're sort of evil chinks of light. Mm. I don't know what they are, chinks of super darkness. Yeah. Uh, and, and they have to be fought against and destroyed. Yeah. And I suppose that that is, um, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what's happened. We, mm. we, we, we now, um, we have become God. Yeah. Uh, I see what you mean, yes. Um, I, but unfortunately now in, 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 in making that digression, mm. I have forgotten. I was saying that uh, Gervais and Dawkins oh, seem oh, to be yeah. capable well, of creating that was it. Yeah, a that's faith. A good point. So I was, I was thinking what immediately occurred to me there was the idea of neo-Thomism. So this idea that the, the attitudes of the scholastics mm. was that the, uh, the purpose, our purpose is to understand the work in, in, in natural philosophy, mm. i.e. science, or mm. uh, well, natural theology rather, i.e. science. Um, is to understand the nature of God's creation, mm -hmm. and and therefore to lie about the the nature of God's creation is is like blasphemous. Okay, and it's as though the, the traditional universities developed along those lines. So that's Thomism. And so who's, then, who's, who's Thomas, Thomas Aquinas? Ah, and so then Neo Neo Thomas. Come on, surely he's a good Catholic boy. You've heard of Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> I have. I've never um, heard of Thomism. And and, and, um, and, and it's too hard to say Aquinasism. Oh uh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> So, so, so neo Thomas is this idea that the universities have maintained that fundamental mm. worship of truth yeah. and idea that it is basically blasphemous, up until recently anyway, yeah. um, it, is, it is basically blasphemous to lie, mm. um, even though the belief in God sort of died off. Mm. So they've maintained this fundamental um, worship of truth mm. and, and this fundamental idea that it is our moral and religious duty to comprehend the nature of God's creation. Okay. And perhaps that's what Gervais and Dawkins are reflecting. It's a, that same heritage. Kind but of it thing. could be argued that eventually it gets to a point where you have to ask, well, what, um, and it's a sort of traditionalist philosophy question, what verifies something as truth? Mm. And in the Platonic worldview, it's, well, look, there's this world of forms and our world is a reflection of the eternal world of forms. Mm. But fundamentally, there is a demiurge that, that over, overarches that. And it could be argued that well, what, what, makes, what, what makes you believe in the truth? Why do you believe in the truth? Mm. What, why is the truth so important? Mm. How do you know it's the truth? Mm. Uh, how do you know that empirical reality is what you say it is? And, and, and the argument is, well, there must be some sort of unchanging something. Mm. Um, that verifies something as true. Mm. And the traditionalist argument is that this is a kind of implicit religion, mm. implicitly, uh, when you're saying, oh, yeah, I believe, yeah, I, well, we, we need to know the truth about the world. Why? Or oh, we just do. Well, why? Well, because, because it's a good in itself. Well, why, why is it a good in itself? Uh, well, to know, the nature, the, to know all this theoretical stuff about the nature of the world. Surely it's good to have some comforting lies, isn't it? And, and you can counter, well, no, because, because something in us means we must understand the truth. Well, what? And that gets us back to this idea that you are revealing the revelation of something, that there's something higher, something eternal. So you, when you were, when you were um, giving that mock uh, dialogue just there, you actually sounded like the key coordinates that I heard in the dawkins Gervais debate. This, this seems very important to them. So they're actually engaged maybe in uh, neo-Thomism. Mm. That's interesting. Very possibly. Very possibly. So I think. I think. Also, also there was a there was a scholar, he's an obscure scholar called Edward Bailey, mm. and he came up. He uh, came up with this. He was a vicar, and mm. he came up with this idea of implicit religion. The idea that people will say they're an atheist, mm. but when you talk to them, you mm. can you can sort of analyze their wording. They'll say things like, "Well, at the end of the day, well, what do you mean by that?" Let's, 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 let's get behind that. What, yeah, so you're, you're, you're seeing life, uh, life is a metaphor and it's mm. like a day. And at the end of the day, you've got to do this. Well, why? Yeah. And what it gets back to is that there are certain unchanging truths. So, so certain things that are just true. Yes. And what makes those things true? Well, nothing. We just, they, 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 they just are true. And the implication is that there are certain eternal truths. And that takes us into a kind of met, almost metaphysical universe. Right. And uh, that's the I. Uh, that's the and the other. I suppose the other, the Odyssey mm. could be to say, well, I value civilization. Mm -hmm. In order for civilization to be preserved, there has to be a fundamental sense of of the truth and that you shouldn't lie and whatever. Mm. Um, in order for that to be the case, if you if you believe in God and God says that you shouldn't lie, then you, you do that. So therefore, we want other people to believe in God, as you mm. just said, you did yourself. Yeah. And therefore, shouldn't we, via effortful control, mm. somehow force ourselves to believe in God? I, I, that's my position. And I was, I was interviewing an uh, interesting guy called um, uh, um, Nick Dixon mm. uh, on The Jolly Heretic recently. And I, mm. Well, I was on his channel, actually. And, and he was telling me about this, that he basically decided that it, 
it's good to believe in God, there are benefits, but I will try and force myself to to believe to believe in God. In the same way that perhaps if you're in a relationship and and it's flagging a bit and you force yourself to remind yourself of how much you used to love her once and then you love her again. I don't know. So wanking the limpiness of your faith. <laughs> That is an excellent, that should perhaps be a title <laughs> for the next Richard Granham, the first I, I Richard Granham theology book, yeah. Wanking the Limp Penis in Your Faith. <laughs> I can imagine that on sale in a, a Christian bookshop. Oh, God. And now, and now on uh, Thought for the Day, we have <laughs> Granham, author of Wanking the Limp Penis of Your Faith. Richard, why, why, why do you feel that a semi-erection is uh, an appropriate metaphor for religiosity in the modern world? <laughs> well, because then if you, if, you, if you believe in God more, then it becomes fully tumescent. <laughs> and the, the ejaculate of faith is... <laughs> the ejaculate of faith is produced and sp spreads its, sp spreads its, its salty life into the mouth of the universe. <laughs> Out of the secular universe, <laughs> swallows in that faith, spits some of it out because the faith so much faith, <laughs> swallows the faith, and it moves mountain. <laughs> oh. Calm. <laughs> oh. Well, that was traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> now we're back to that young man there, that broken <laughs> narcissist. <laughs> Uh, I'll see if I could get Gervais to write the forward for that one. <laughs> oh, God. Um, yes, now then. <laughs> now then, now then, now then. Now then, now speaking, then. Of, speaking of sexual weirdness, now then, now then. <laughs> now then, now, now then. then, now then. <laughs> Boys and girls, <sighs> there, was, there was one of you that wanted to, uh, wanted to, wanted to come, on, come, come on the show. Do you want, you want me to fix it for you to believe in God? Oh, dear. Um, yes. I think, I think the cameraman's going to sort of break it. I'm thinking that when he cuts this, which is the term he uses, He's going to break at this point. <laughs> going to, at this point, he's going to... Oh. Yes. Where were we, anyway? Very, yes. very good. So, um, uh, University of Durham. Durham. And, and, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, old, old, old Testament. Uh, that was great. What, what was the... What was the um, even, it, I've, I've told you in the interview you did with me, even though I didn't enjoy the behavioural psychology degree, there were things I took away from it. What did, what was taken away from from the degree? I suppose that some of the lecturers. I mean, these are people that were born in the forties, mm. so these were people that were actually, but to some extent, believed in academic values rather than the nonsense they have now. Okay. Uh, and uh, and for example, uh, Professor Davis, um, who was also the master of my college, mm. on the first day when he he said he, he just said, look, some of you. Um, uh, will find all of your ideas questioned and stuff, and that's the purpose of being here. Okay. That's why you're here. And yeah. um, uh, to, to have all of your ideas questioned. Jesus, some intellectual that's, rigor. That's the point of here. That's, they don't like that, you shouldn't be here. Wonderful. So, so, um, so there was that. So I took that away from it. Yeah. Um, I think I took away, um, they taught you how to think more critically via specific methods. They would tell you how to do this. Mm. Uh, defining terms, <coughs> unpacking them in detail, mm. um, and nuanced thought. Um, that's what they were teaching, uh, mm. at least with my degree. Yeah. Uh, and so that was useful. And then after Durham, um, I became absolutely fascinated by fundamentalism when I was at university. Really? Because a, thir a third of the corridor were members of the Christian Union, which was the fundamentalist Christian group. Mm -hmm. and, and there was this weird uh, tension a well, mm. number of tensions. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, th there was the tension that they were extremely nice people, mm. uh, and so, and but yet they believed you're going to get a hell, and they believed all of this. They didn't believe in evolution. Mm. They they did, didn't. Some of them didn't believe in dinosaurs. They thought that the uh, the, the the devil placed the fake bones there to confuse the non-believer and mm. lead them away from Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but then they they were also some of my best friends, mm. and in some cases remain some of my best friends. And there was also, and I've talked to other people about this. There was also a sort of a sexual tension. <laughs> Mm. Which is that these these Christian girls, mm. very kind, very genuine, very very pretty in a kind of um, pure, yeah. uh, uh, honest way, yeah. um, and um, and so you end up in the and and they can't have uh, sexual relationships with the Christian men because that's all you know. Yeah. They're, they're part of a, sort of a, almost not a cult. That's the wrong word, but but you know a, a religious group Sect. that it has yeah. has 
very strong rules about sexual activity. Yeah. And so you, you ended up, and a lot of people I talked to about this at my university and others, like Oxford, which is the same thing, you'd have these almost like pseudo-sexual relationships between non-Christian men and Christian girls. Okay. Um, so there was that there was that element. When you it. say pseudo-sexual, you mean it was sexual but limited? Yeah, so you didn't actually have sex. You could do stuff, but things, not, right, not yeah. other things, yeah. Uh, a lot of touching and, and, and things that yeah, you would Frottage. Yeah, a lot of things that you would, uh, kissing or whatever, that yeah. you, uh, and even things beyond that, that you just wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, like now, you look back on it now, yeah. and you think, oh, well, that was basically a sort of sexual relationship, or not? I mean, yeah. kind of, I, I, yeah. but then it was just a sort of, oh, well, you didn't even think about it. Right. But that was, I that, I thought at the time that was just me, but no, mm. no, that was, lo was loads of people that were in that situation right. with, with these right. girls. So, um, and uh, uh, non-Christian girls with Christian boys, mm. same thing. So, so yeah, so that was, um, so that, I found them absolutely fascinating, and at the end of the degree, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, the, th the three things I thought about were um, academic, mm. uh, journalist, mm. or very liberal vicar. Like vicar that doesn't believe in God. That's... So what, what, what do you do if you've got theology to be for Christ's sake? <laughs> so, so, do you be so, the super progressive vicar? So what are you supposed to do? Yeah. So, so I thought, what do I do? And so I thought um, uh, I could do a master's degree. Mm. And my parents agreed to fund me to do the master's degree. But then mm. I got funding from the University of Aberdeen it was, mm. uh, for uh, the, he wanted it to be a full doctorate, mm. um, or some funding. And um, and so that's where I went. And then... What was it? Was it still theology? Or? Yeah, yeah, divinity department. Um, but it was, it, was a, <coughs> it was a field work, anthropological um, analysis of, a fu of fundamentalist Christian student groups. Mm. Mm. And so I did, I, so I would immerse myself in, you know, they almost like live as one of them. Mm. Um, they do things like on a Saturday morning, it'd be Christian Union football. Mm. And it was, it was just like a normal football match, mm. except that whereas in a normal football match, the, the manager, you know, bollocks you all at half time or, mm. or, or, or revs you up or whatever, you pray <laughs> to you know, do better in the second half. You know, God, guide my, guide my foot mm. to this football <laughs> at a particular angle um, such that it curls into the goal. Mm. Amen. <laughs> and and um, and uh, yeah, and so so it was, it was a whole different culture. There were two cultures at Durham University that, that were new to me. That I well, at least two, but two main ones. The one was just the English nobility and aristocracy, mm. um, and people from private school, full stop. Mm. But then more specifically, public school. This whole culture that they had, uh, separate culture. There's different claim, all different clothes. They mm. And I was I was very um, artistic when I was so I wrote plays, had play at the Edinburgh Festival, mm. wrote comedy sketches for the Dar Review, wrote poetry, mm. um, and and, uh, and and they all like that. They don't write that themselves. They're not very creative, the upper class, mm. but they like they, they, they like they like they like the sort of the, the lower classes that are creative. And I'm like, mm. oh, yeah, I saw your play. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was mm. really good. Hey, yeah, you should come to the party. Me and Charlie Blair, we're having a having a party. Charlie Blair's got some cigars in from Cuba. They totally should come. It's been great. We have some really, really big, juicy steaks. Come along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and uh, Harry H. P. will be there, and uh, and uh, and Harry A. J. And, and Harry B. J. And whatever. <laughs> and and um, yeah. And and then there, uh, so there was that culture. But then there was this Christian culture, which sort of imbricated uh, the upper middle class. It was quite middle class, but not that they weren't like the top people. It, sorry, just to just to interrupt you for a second. You. It sounds like. Um, Though you are not a man of faith, you you feel quite a lot of affection for people who have who have faith. Yeah, my wife's a vicar, so I mean, you're 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 warm and uh, uh, to uh, I mean, just Christians or or people. It's like you religion. said, I want to live in a society where other people believe in God, right. and that society extends even to my own house. Okay. And my own, you know, bed where I sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 I, I, I want to God live. God is in, there, whether you want to or not. I want to live in a society where uh, where other people believe in God yeah. fervently. Yeah. Um. Uh. uh I don't mean. I'm not saying I have to. Yeah. But but, but uh, and, and I used to be that I would just wankerishly um, question their beliefs and whatever. Mm. And then I re I guess it was it's a rebellion against what's in power. Mm. And what was in power when we were kids mm. was still the. Christian yes. Anglican society. Yes. And so then I'm against that and I'll question it and I'll pull it apart and whatever. Mm. And then when I realized when, in my early 20s, when I was a, a postgraduate, I, mean, mm. I understood uh, almost viscerally mm. um, under new labor and whatever. <laughs> um, that it was that they were that they were that they were no longer in power mm. and there were, and there were, there was a new power in the land which mm. was the woke 
mm. and that that's restricting your freedom and that yeah. that's lying to you and that and that then then suddenly you start to think there's a new enemy this is the this is the enemy mm. uh and that's what i've thought ever ever since whereas when i was an undergraduate mm. i wasn't quite aware of that and so i had no i wasn't politically controversial or anything okay i was a member of the conservative party and mm. i and, and so i was i was right wing um, whereas almost all students are left wing, mm. but nothing beyond that. I wasn't thinking, looking into, well, of course, we were a less polarized society. There was no internet. Yeah. So you couldn't really look into these things. But I wasn't looking into things like race. I, well, I, I had briefly as a teenager, mm. I wrote this um, in, when it was coming up to the 97 election, and I became fascinated by that. And I, and I got the phone book and I wrote, rang up all these political parties and got mm. them to send me their information pack. Mm. And then, and then, uh, um, and I wrote a pamphlet about it, about all that, and then sold it around the school fifty bit pop. It was my mm. first venture into publishing, so mm. a lot of teachers bought it. Yeah, and and uh, and I wrote, one of them I wrote was the BNP, and they had a, and they had a bookshop, and mm. there was books with titles like I think the books for sale. But the titles like Did Six Million Really Die? Oh, I remember God. I bought that. That was like a pound. Mm. And then one was called I, um, The Biology of the Race Problem, mm. and then one was called IQ and Racial. I bought all three of those books. All mm. those titles. Like, wow. Mm. For some reason, at that age, I was able to suppress that information and not mm. really talk about it much. Right. Except that um, when we were doing GCSE English, mm. we had to do as part of this an oral presentation, mm. and you could do it on anything you wanted. Mm. So, and I thought, well, I'll do it on this book about the Holocaust didn't happen. Mm. And my teacher had no problem with that. She was like, yeah, fine. Imagine that now, if wow. you've done a presentation on how the Holocaust didn't wow, happen. Wow, 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 wow. And, and in the end, I didn't. In the end, I did it on the music of 17th century playwright and wit Thomas Durfee. Mm. But, but um, I was going to do it on that. She had no problem with that. And I remember mm. that we were on the train coming back from a school exhibition, mm. an exhibition in, uh, I don't know, some school trip. And mm. this teacher, this old teacher called Mrs. Rotherham, um, said to Miss Douglas, they were talking about me in front of me. So, um, what's Edward doing his presentation on? Mm. And Miss Douglas said, um, he's doing it on um, the evidence that the Holocaust never happened. And 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 and, and uh, uh, Miss Miss Palmer, she just looks at me like, <laughs> <laughs> terrifying. Do, but do, I mean, obviously, I did. It was it did happen. But but yeah. but but, but um, uh, yeah, it was an interesting thing to read. Anyway. Well, so were you? All, have you been your whole life uh, on the right? Yeah, I would say so, and, and and probably for quite ridiculous reasons, actually. So I remember, uh, um, I don't know how old I was, seven or eight. Um, in the Roald Dahl book, mm. uh, Revolting Rhymes, mm. and it says that a judge would say without a blink, mm. 10 years hard labor in the clink. Mm. So I said to my mum, what's labor? What does that mean? Mm. And she said, well, it's like, you know, like heart breaking rocks, you know, like talk, like, like really horribly hard work. Mm. And I was like, what? And I'm thinking, well, there's this party called the Labour Party. Mm. Well, that's what they want us to do. <laughs> they sound awful. <laughs> the party of punishment. And there were other things about them that disgusted me, like their leader was ginger and bald. And Welsh. <laughs> You're talking about Mr. Kinnock. Yeah. So like, <laughs> ugh. He's, he's, he talked funny. He was bald and he was wet and he was ginger. I was like, ugh. And they want us to do all this Labour stuff. <laughs> oh my God. I never want there to be a Labour government. Right. And then my parents voted conservative anyway, mm. and, and they would tell me about how terrible it was in the 70s and mm. all this sort of thing. Mm. And so these sort of, and then just my general hatred of change, which I've always hated. Yeah. Um, and so these things came together to a, 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 and of just people that are obviously lying and manipulative, which Tony Blair, whatever, just so clearly was. Mm. I, they went from being just a bunch of incompetence, basically. Mm. Uh, Roy Hattersley, a fat, spitting man, like just mm. bad PR, mm. to these sleek, manipulative little serpents. Mm. Uh, and so, no, I, I, I just knew this is bad news. This is, this is bad news. And it was, of course, terrible. How, the worst thing that ever happened to Britain, I think. How, how would you define your political stance today? I, yeah, you get, you get left-wing journalists that ask me that annoying question. And yeah. I, I just say, uh, uh, a 19th century British imperialist, or a very, very, very high Tory, so high that you get sort of altitude sickness, a British imperialist. <laughs> you want to bring the empire back? Uh, yes. Uh, not, not only me. I mean, I yeah. was talking, my son, uh, at his nursery school had this uh, Anglo-Indian teacher. And he was saying to me that when he was a kid uh, uh, in the 70s, a, a lot of old people in India mm. like, missed the empire. Yes. And they would talk about this. They would say yes. life was much better. It was much more organized. Mm. There was no corruption. Mm. 
life was just better mm. under the British. They 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 were dead now, but mm. they pined after that. It was a, it was a better time. Mm. So I, I, it's not it's not just and, I, and in Kenya. I was talking to um oh I can't forget her name, but this Kenyan academic, and she was saying to me much the same thing when mm. she was a kid. A lot of older Kenyans missed the empire. Of course, it's better with the British and running things. Of course, it is. <laughs> And 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 uh, not the British now, not like the cut, stupid British, but the British, the British of our grandparents' generation. Right. Of course, it's better if the British are running things. You said the cucked British. Yeah, not the now, the British now, where the most British people. Do you feel it's a just... cucked, a cucked country? Yeah, of course it is. It's a degenerate country which promotes degeneracy mm. and uh, and individualism mm. and uh, sexual degeneracy mm. and uh, woke values that is, that have that have seeped so far into the fabric of society. Mm. I mean, I was in uh, Crewe in Cheshire mm. in the summer. Mm. Like the car rental place, Enterprise, mm. is itself religiously sanctioned with the rainbow flag, like everywhere. Mm. There were pubs in Crewe that, mm. were, that were flying the rainbow flag. And mm. this is a, like a working class town. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's gone down in terms of the virtue signaling that far, mm -hmm. it's, it, in terms of the uh, Simmel's uh, trickle effect. Mm. Uh, it's it seeped into the very nature of, of the whole culture mm. uh, in a way that in Finland, um, or at least where I live in Finland, mm. it hasn't. And, 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 and people still have a sense that we're Finns and we need to survive as a people and yep. we're under threat from outsiders and yep. we are unique and we are special and we are important and we need to survive and we need to make sacrifices to survive. And, and, and they have a compulsory, or not compulsory, but they have it's very strongly socially important. Like if you're a man mm. and you apply for a job, mm. you will put on your CV that you've done military service mm -hmm. and you will put on your CV what rank you attained in military service and mm -hmm. you will take the view rightly mm. that a lot of people will judge you mm. badly if you have not done military service, if you've done the sort of, they call it civili paladus, mm. um, civil service, I call it homo paladus. But, this, but this, 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 this idea that you, instead of doing the military service, you do this civil service where they're like, they give you a job, I don't know, working in a library for no money yes. or whatever. Yes, same option in Israel, isn't right. it? Right, well, like, that, that is, that is that, there's a substantial segment mm. of people, even of my age, mm. that regard that with derision. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so uh, as a man, it is, I don't know about in Helsinki, Helsinki is just degenerate, but I mean, mm. out, out in Northern Finland, that you've, you, you've got to do military service or you're mm. pathetic. So I heard you say um, that the, the country has a sense, a strong sense of self, it has a strong sense of its own future, its own individuality. In its some own, part, I mean, that's decreasing, that's decreasing, part. obviously. I mean, it, basically Finland does everything that England does about 30 years later. And you, you would think that would, Britain would do well to have some of that vision back. Yes. Is that a fundamentally racist position to adopt? Uh, well, I, 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 the problem with that word racist is that it's one of these, it's one of these shut up terms. It's one of these indefinite terms, like mm. um, powerful emotional terms, like mm. witch in the, mm. in the, in the, in the, uh, 17th century or papist or, mm. or something like that mm. where, which is which can be elasticated to to mean to basically take in absolutely any deviance from the orthodox position mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. that's the point of it it's to it's to it's to uh to connect uh, uh any um deviance from the orthodox position to something fundamentally evil mm -hmm. and thereby reprove you mm -hmm. and push any potential doubters mm -hmm. back onto the path of orthodoxy mm -hmm. so i just think we just shouldn't use those terms. Mm. But is it is it is it a, the, the fundamentally we know from research by I don't know Putnam for example or mm. Tatu Van Hanen mm. that societies that are multicultural that are multiracial multiethnic are riven by uh, uh, d division. Mm. They are low in social trust. Mm. They are low in common goods. Mm. They do not stay together. They balkanize. Mm. He, uh, Tatu Van then found that 66% of the variance between nations in internal conflict is mm. basically caused by being multi-ethnic. Right. So you, you cannot have a united multicultural society. There's no such thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Finland is probably about 96% white. And so it's it's in a position where it can still be like that, whereas Britain is about less than eighty percent uh, white, and 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 it's so you know you've got to a position now where you have an Indian prime minister, you have a, a various other uh, non-native British within within the government and within all kinds of positions of power, and you end up with just a balkanized society. So you, and that, so you, there is a Britain, mm. but but the level of also the 
when that happens, the level of social trust is reduced even among the natives mm. because they rightly perceive that other natives will collaborate against them mm. with the foreigners to mm. gain individual power, which of course they do. I mean, the whole coalition mm. of the Labour Party is the working class white vote <laughs> and the ethnic vote. I mean, about 65% of Muslims in the UK vote Labour. Mm. So, or 70% 70, 70 is it. It's, it's, a, it's a coalition. A, a, a very good example of that is George Galloway's Respect Party. I mean, it's mm. basically George Galloway, white leader, mm. and then foreigners. Yeah. Um, so you can't have that. And so in Finland at the moment, you, you have, you're seeing it changing, like you'll see TV commercials where there's six Finns socializing, eating crisps, and there's one black man. Mm. Right. Well, of course, in Finland, it would be one white person, one black person, so England, one white person, one black person, one Asian person. Like it would be nonsense. It would be mm. just nonsense. Or no white people at all. There's no white people at all, yeah. Mm. Um, or a white woman and a black man. Mm. But but in Finland, no, they, they, you're seeing what we saw in the 90s, mm. which was the subtle little, all of, we'll put a little representative non white, but not in a position of power, mm. not unrealistic, mm. but we'll just put one here, put one here, and make out it's normal. Mm. And in Finland, it's not normal. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's not. I, I don't know, but I can't comment on Helsinki, but in Olu, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know Finns that have in Olu that have non-white friends. I, I have to ask you a couple of uh, knowingly stupid questions about racism. Oh yeah. Um, but I agree with your with your comment that uh, the way we use racism today is so overstretched it's become bordering on meaningless, and it really is largely used just to corral people back into the orthodoxy and shame them for stepping outside the orthodoxy. But racism is a real phenomena in the world. I'm sure you'd agree. How, what's a useful definition of racism? Well, I, that's the problem. The problem is that the, the, when, the, when the term, it's like if we, I mean, there may have been a time when, I'm trying to think of an example. Well, there, 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 I can think of a very quick example. Mm. So there was a time when the, the word idiot mm. was a scientific term and it meant something quite specific. Yes. And there was a time when the word lunatic was a scientific term and it meant something quite specific. And so you could say to me, well, what's a useful definition of idiot? Mm. And I think, as I, as I recall, idiot is somebody that's just congenitally stupid. Yeah. Uh, whereas lunatic was somebody who's normal and then they have a mental problem and they become weird and mental and crazy, yes. right? Yeah. Um, so that's the useful definition. What it, what it then becomes is mm. a form of insult mm. where you encompass Anything that deviates from the intelligence norm is, oh, you're an idiot. You've, you've said something incorrect, you're an idiot, right? Mm. So, so you could push the definition of idiot back to mm. meaning a person who basically for genetic reasons or due to brain damage early in childhood mm. has low IQ. Yep. But the problem is that that word idiot still has so many emotional connotations that mm. realistically you should probably, if you want to have a, a civilized, uh, objective, uh, academic discussion, just stop using the word idiot, mm. which of course we have. Mm. And we we use the word mentally retarded. Mm. Then the same thing happened to retarded. Mm. And so now we say, uh, what is I don't know what it is these days, mentally challenged, yeah. or I don't know what the term is. And then that, and then off, it just carries on. Dif differently abled or... Well, whatever, yeah. So it's the same with the word racist. It's, it, 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 it's become uh, the new, uh, uh, almost like a swear word. Um, mm. and, and so we just probably just shouldn't use it. But if we have to use it, I would say that racism is to discriminate against somebody mm. as an individual mm. on the basis of their race. And that is something that I, as did, I personally don't do. Okay. And, and people, people, you get people that watch The Jolly Heretic or whatever, that, that some pe people that uh, uh, are certainly rather, um, how can I put this, uh, a tad dogmatic, shall we say, mm. who object to the fact that I have had Lipton Matthews, who's Jamaican, on. And I'm, I will have him on, and I'll have him on again, because mm. he's highly intelligent and says very intelligent, interesting things. Mm. And I don't care if he's Jamaican. So, that, so there, are, there are white followers of yours who don't want you to have non-white guests? I'm afraid there are, so I'm young. And, and I think that's a, that's, that's a balance for all of us that are seen as dissident, whatever, on the right, Mm. Um, academics, YouTubers, mm. have to, I've talked to others about this. Mm. And we have the same problem. An, an, an element among your followership mm. are woke but right wing. The, they're the right wing equivalent of woke. Meaning a dogmatic, dogmatic, extreme, extreme. Yeah, all Poss that. They're everything that is woke, but emotionally they're, but dysregulated. They're, they're, yeah, and... probably high neuroticism. Mm. Uh, hot, probably high in psychopathic traits, mm. um, where um, uh, and and that's just a that's just a fact of life. We all know this. People like AA or mm. probably um, uh, we we all know this is true. 
and, and the, the people, people dealing with Fuentes in real life, mm. I'm sure, um, would be perfectly polite and reasonable to somebody of any racial group. Yeah. Um, and, and so we know this is true. I mean, I got I got a lot of stick a while ago because mm. I had this this person on the channel, Evelyn Grant, mm. who is a um, a homosexual transsexual, not an order to kind of transsexual, a homosexual transsexual, i.e. that they're a highly feminine, born a highly feminine, because order to kind of transsexuals are masculinized men that okay. have a sexual fetish, which is associated with autism, which is associated with being masculinized, yeah. where they are sexually aroused mm -hmm. by the idea of themselves as a woman. Okay. That's all to kind of transsexual. Homosexual transsexual is that you are a very, very, very feminized um, man, mm -hmm. such that you basically think of yourself <clears throat> as a female, mm -hmm. and then you you um, you uh, have the relevant operations, and then you have a you have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Whereas the autogynephilus transsexuals are overwhelmingly they become a woman and they're lesbians. Right, they still want women. Right. So so anyway, this and this person happens to have quite interesting views and interesting background and whatever. And so I had I had Evelyn on, mm -hmm. and a lot of people got very upset about this. But I, I see no reason. So just, and I would again, I would call if you're going to say how do you define I don't know transphobia. Mm. That's how I would the, the idea that okay, I will not speak to you mm. because you are transsexual. I won't. I will speak to you. Yeah. Um. Uh, or I will not speak to you because you're gay. No, okay. I will. I will speak to you. Yeah. Um. So that's how I. That's the racism. It should, it should be that you will discriminate against you. You will basically say, I'm not going to come to this dinner party if you invite that black person. Right. Right. That's racist. That's surely. Yeah. So when people. Okay, stupid question. Why do people accuse you of being racist? Um, well, people. I mean, you you mean you mean the, the far left and the people that are, that are, the, that are the, the the enforcers of orthodoxy and the people yes. that, uh, that, that that gain their power by competitively yes. being enforcers of the orthodoxy. Uh, be, be, uh, because uh, well, there's a number of levels on which you can ask that. What <clears> they <throat> would say is something like, uh, "Well, I am looking at race differences, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at race differences in intelligence mm -hmm. and." and personality and whatever, mm. um, and to, that's racist. No, I would say that's not racist. I'm not discriminating against anybody. Am I? I'm just mm. looking at the objective data. Mm. But their attitude is that to, it's like to even suggest that is mm. perhaps upsetting to non-whites, which it isn't. I mean, I've interviewed black people. They're not upset about it. They mm. feel patronized that you would say to them, I will not talk to you about this because you're black. Yeah. I, I, I talk, and there's evidence that the left, the left change how they talk to non-whites. They patronize them. Yes. I talk to everybody the same, mm -hmm. including children and dogs. Mm. Um, and and uh, you just treat them with in individual respect, and and uh, so that's but that's that's so they've no justification on that definition. No, they've expanded the definition, which is racism is that you deviate from the from our orthodoxy on race. Mm. Our orthodoxy is that there are no race differences in intelligence, or personality, or whatever, or even that race doesn't exist as a concept, mm. except when it does. When we want to say that we need more black organ donors or whatever, then something mm. does exist. But anyway, they're not consistent. Mm. Um, uh, so that's why I'm uh, I'm racist. And another level which you could look at it is um, there. They are narcissists, mm -hmm. uh, and narcissists like power mm -hmm. and authority over other people, mm -hmm. and I am challenging them and saying they're idiots, basically, and they're wrong, and they're liars, and they're dis disingenuous, yep. um, and so they don't like that. Yep. Um, they are Machiavellian, um, and they're, 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 their power base is that there is this morality and the, the, uh, based around uh, not looking at certain topics and whatever, um, and they are enforcing that, mm -hmm. and I have my research perhaps have the potential to undermine that and thus mm. undermine what gives them power, undermine their niche. Yes. Remove them. Yes. Um, and therefore you are a danger and you need to be suppressed. But I mean, to put it in the terms that you use in your, uh, uh, in, in your podcast, um, I, I am committing unto them narcissistic injury yeah. by challenging them and challenging the thing which allows them the, the, to paper over the cracks uh, in their sort of shattered sense of self and say, mm. oh, I'm morally superior to others, I'm better than others, or whatever, I'm better mm. than others. And, and they are projecting onto me mm. that their deep-seated doubts about the ideology which they are telling themselves is true in order to give themselves a clear moral sense of self. And, and they deep down, they do feel Mm. Um, uh, racist feelings or whatever you know, feelings that, uh, 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 that they want to be. They know they want to be with their own type. They, they, people that are people that are left wing are no more are almost essentially no more likely to have non-white friends than a right wing. And this is the research. Yeah. Ultimately, if you if you if you look at let, let's judge a person by their behaviour. Let's yes. do it like that. Right. If you live in London, it's fifty percent non-white. Mm. So you should have fifty percent non-white friends. Mm. And if you don't, you're a racist. Right. Why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? Mm. I, I, the only thing I can think of is that you are attracted to genetic similarity. Mm. You're discriminating unconsciously against non-whites. Mm. You're racist. Yeah. Right. So, so 
these people know on some level, I think, that they are racist and they mm. hate that side of themselves mm. because it, contra- it, gives, it causes cognitive dissonance. Mm. And therefore, how do you deal with it? You, you project it onto these evil racists who, in fact, aren't racist. Because I have, uh, you know, uh, 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 the one thing I said, I said to somebody once, one of these lefts, I said, you know, you have, all your friends are white. I have friends that are Indian. Mm. I have friends that are black. Mm. I have friends from all over the place. Mm. And he said, well, that's exactly the kind of argument a racist would use. So, so, so it's like, how can you win? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm showing you the, another one said to me, yeah. I am so secure that I am not a racist, that I don't need to have non-white friends. That's, yes, you can't even really argue against that kind of... Just self-deluding... It's delusional, it's delusional, yeah. Yeah, you are, people are, whether they like it or not, people operate in their genetic interests. If you are attracted and people are as white people, I mean, it's just a fact, more mm. likely to be attracted to people that not just of their own race, but that are even within uh, the European, mm. more similar to them. Mm. There is almost like a narcissistic element to sexual attraction among, ironically, among the least narcissistic people, among the people that are case strategists, because yeah. if you're evolved to an unstable yet difficult environment, mm. then you need the, um, the gene complexes, which mean that you are adapted to those to the, to the pathogens in that environment to not break up. Mm. Well, how do you do that? You have to be find someone like yourself. Mm. Also, you need to be high in nurture. You need to nurture your offspring. Mm. Well, how will you be more likely to do that? Well, if they're more like you, mm. then you have more of a genetic interest in them. You are more likely to nurture them. Mm. And so therefore you sexually select for someone that's relatively similar to you. Yeah. Um, and it is people that are more are strategic that would be likely to sexually select for people that are just totally different from them, but just happen to you know, look, look good. What is a, what, what's R strategic? The opposite of K, the opposite of slow. So, so R is that you're adapted to an unstable yet easy ecology. Mm. If it's unstable yet easy, you, you, you don't need to be really adapted to that ecology because it's not predictable. You can't predict it. How can you adapt to it? Mm. So all you, all you go for is just evidence of genetic health. And what is evidence of genetic health? Well, it's youth and be- it's beauty. Mm. And so, um, and, and youth fertility in the woman. So you, you go for that. And the, the women go for the male equivalent. Sounds like me. Muscular, what? That sounds like me. Well, yeah, I, I do. That doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> some, some of the things that you told me in your in the interview we did in uh, in Barnes, um, yeah. yeah, highly intelligent art astrologist. <laughs> I, I usually like girls who are genetically different to me as well. Yeah, you would do. Yeah. You're an art astrologist. So, the, mean, so like that's that, typical like that for an girlfriend, like that girlfriend. Well, I don't know if it's typical, but I, I think it's it's more. Um, it seems to be more how it works. Mm. Um, more likely. Mm. Uh, but there's all kinds of variation. And also men, men make trade-offs. Mm. So you might want to have a, a nice English girl mm. uh, who's similar to you mm. and who's pretty, mm. uh, but you are not sufficiently high state, high value to get that. Mm. So instead you go for a pretty foreign girl. Interesting. So you've traded, you've traded one to the Com- other. Compromise. The, right, exactly. Yeah. Those kinds of things can occur. Um, I hate being put in the position uh, you know, when the race issue comes up where you have to say things like, oh, well, all my girlfriends are non-white or, oh, I have lots of friends who are not white. Um, something about that bothers me. I feel like I've been bullied in a way. And, so I, and I, also, I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't, I don't become friends. I've got a friend in Olu who's Indian background. Yeah, I don't yeah. become friends with people because of their race. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> and I think, and I think there's a degree to which some people on the left probably do. Yes. That they probably think, I mean, so you can imagine that Jeremy Corbyn thinking to himself, yeah, it looks pretty good for me to be with Diana Abbott. Right. Back when she was, well. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> you can't win. <laughs> quite how he, I don't know. But, yes, um, yes. but, 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 but um, yeah, but there was, there was, the, 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 it's almost like a, a trophy. Yeah. And you probably do get that. I mean, I've, I know of cases of, let's say, you know, a girl has autism mm. and she's badly behaved. Mm. And so the, the, the upper middle class people don't want their darlings to be friends with her because mm. she's badly behaved and she swears and whatever. Mm. But then she's got the official diagnosis of autism. Mm. And suddenly you can say, my daughter, mm. yes, she has a friend, very, she's autistic. But she, wow, what a good girl. Yes. What a tolerant, kind. Yeah, yes. my daughter is tolerant. Yeah. And yes. so suddenly it's a trophy. Yes. And yes. suddenly they want that. Yes. 
Yes, so, just so they can tell people just so they can it. just just the, yeah it was a fascinating study I didn't know about this study um, until recently there was just a study that came out by someone called Zacker in Germany and mm. he showed that people that are environmental activists are higher in dark triad traits than controls we, obviously we expect that mm -hmm. but there was one study that he cited I hadn't heard of this study which mm. looked at the psychology of people that eat organic food That's right. and it found that a big mediating factor, a big factor mm. in why people eat organic food is basically trait narcissism. It's so they can boast about it to other people. <laughs> and, and those people are one great person. Yes, I am. I am very ethical. That, that was what was shown in the study. It I, doesn't surprise me at all, because if I think of all the bloody woke people I know from university, they all eat bloody organic food. I, I've seen a little bit of, of myself in that, though, I have to admit, because... Uh... Yeah, you're drinking some fucking weird milk now. <laughs> Oat milk. Oat milk. Or some stupid... Not milk. That's not milk. I'd like to emphasize, <laughs> this is milk. <laughs> From a cow. From a cow. <laughs> this is um, the, I think it was the British philosopher Bertrand Russell said there's two reasons to read a book. One is the enjoyment of reading the book and the second one is to tell people about it. Right. So I'll read a book and be like, I just read Dostoevsky. I'm damn sure going to mention that on podcasts. Mm, I've, mm, I've mm. forced myself through Thus Spake Zarathustra page by page by Nietzsche. I'm going to tell people about that. There is, that's a, it's, it's innate, isn't it? But I think what you're talking about is where it goes beyond a normal it goes, beyond, it goes beyond it. I mean, and you're doing it. It's costly signaling as well. You're, it's, organic food is more expensive. Yeah. So on a not even particularly subtle level, you're saying, I've got the money for organic food. Yeah. I assume oat milk is more expensive than milky milk. It is. Um, and so, uh, and so it, it, it's costly signaling. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was in uh, Oxford um, some months ago, and I wanted to go to an Indian restaurant. And by Indian restaurant, I meant what we went to in Liverpool, right? a, a British, a good old fashioned Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi. things I've heard of. <laughs> but, the, but, but, you know, I was with um, somebody who wanted to go to an Indian restaurant with good reviews. Yeah. And this was called Mowgli or something. Mugly, yeah. Mowgli. Yeah. And it was, dis it was disgusting. <laughs> and, it was, and it was nothing I'd heard of. And we almost ended up at that in Liverpool. That's right. And, yes. at the, and at the last minute, I realised, yes. hang on, it's a chain. It's, a, it's chain. a chain of terrible stuck-up restaurants where you sit on swings and there's Christmas lights <laughs> in the place, and there's, there's curry that doesn't taste of curry, and, the, and, the, and it's just it's authentic Indian. It's though. not though. I've been to India, <laughs> and although, admittedly, in Delhi or in Jaipur or in Agra or in Pushka, mm. um, I haven't heard of any of the dishes because mm. it's, it's Bengal is the yeah. stuff that we've heard of. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or um, um, what's the other place where the Sikhs live? That state. Um, but anyway, Pakistan. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's spicy as hell. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 Um, yeah. uh, I had what's that? What's the spinach one? Um, alu, alu gobi. Alu, alu no gobi no. potato. Isn't it? Um, um, paneer. Paneer. No, 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 no paneer, paneer, paneer is the cheese. cheese. It doesn't matter. But there's anyway, there's, there's, there's a spinach, spinach based curry. <laughs> and it's quite a mild curry in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and in in Delhi. It's, Ferocious, it's fero yeah. But there's no, there's no, um, they don't source stuff, do they? We love our sources, but there's no, there's very little source there. They don't, they don't source stuff too much. No, not so much. No, and I was in, I was in one place in Central Delhi. I forget the name of the road, and they, they served the food to us on uh, banana leaves. Nice. It was, very, it was, that was very. That was yeah. Very, that was very pleasant. I, I like the most white version of Indian, as you say, Pakistani Bang Bangladeshi food. Stuff with cream in it, nuts. If it's mm. sweet and nutty and creamy, I'm into it. Well, I've managed. I'm very pleased. On um, I do all the cooking in our house, uh -huh. and on a Monday, I do. I, I want. To, I want. I must have a curry once a week, or I. I feel. I feel like dysregulated. <laughs> and and as 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 as, 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 as an Englishman, um, and and so when I started off, when we moved to Finland in '06, I did mm. all the cooking, and I just I just go well, five. I just cooked curry every day. Wow. And then my wife said that you, by doing this, you've 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 damaged, you've put me off curry for life. And yes. So she just yes. refuses to eat curry, which is yeah. a terrible shame. Well, yeah. at least if I cook it. Yeah. So so I used to do chicken korma and then various other ones that I could do, chicken madras. Mm -hmm. um, not with sauce. I mean, we make the sauce myself mm -hmm. from from finding it on the internet or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, or cookbooks in those days, mm. and and uh, and then now I've limited. I've, I've been compelled to limit it to one day a week. Mm. But recently, I found that my son and daughter quite like chicken tikka. Oh ah, yes, which is spicier. Ah, you just yes. get the basic. Thing, it's in the genes. Put it's the in the DNA. In, put the yeah, they're half English. Yeah, yeah, they're half. Well, n none of the Duttons actually went to India. Yeah, no, they went to Nigeria. Ah. and the mid and the Caribbean. Mm. Uh, a collateral ancestor that was the governor of Barbados. Mm. But um, and an ancestor who I guess I'm indirectly named after him, mm. who died in uh, Old Calabar mm -hmm. in southern Nigeria, age 26 of typhoid. <laughs> 
Mm. But he was an oil trader. Mm. But um, no, but anyway, it, that happens in June. And so they, they, they um, yeah, they like it. So that's, that's Monday. Mm. Mm. There's a... Uh... Whenever I've gone abroad, uh, like in Malaysia and the UAE, there's there's a lot of uh, Pakistani people there. There's a lot of Indians in uh, in Malaysia. And if I tell them that British people love Indian and Pakistani food, they don't believe me. I'm like, no, this is when when there's a birthday, when there's a celebration. God, we've even done it at Christmas. One I, year. I, I would I would go as so far as saying that, like, there's a percentage of the English population. Yes. I don't know what percent it might be. Twenty five percent, maybe. Yes. That eat Chinese food. Right. And that they don't eat Indian food. Right. That my my childhood best friend, my family best friends, yeah. my, like my godmother and her, mm. her, they were a family that ate Chinese food. Mm. And I was always that made me suspicious. Yes. They were also Catholic. Uh, I don't know if there's correlation. There could be. But, <laughs> but um, there's Catholics who eat Chinese, and then there's Catholics who eat Indian. Yeah, exactly. You or you just say good or bad. Good or bad Catholics. Catholics. <laughs> um, but the, the, they had Chinese food. That was the thing, mm. not Indian food. Mm. Whereas we had Indian food and never Chinese food. And then presumably there's some families that mixed the two. But I didn't read my father. Basically they're, hate, they're called degenerates. Yeah. My father hasy, hated Chinese food. And so I didn't even really have Chinese food. I had Chinese food once on holiday in Dorset in about 1986 yeah. Yeah. and didn't like it. Yeah. And then um, had it again when I went to university. And then suddenly there were all these middle class people that liked Chinese food. Mm. And then I tried it. And I was like, that's all right, I suppose. Mm. There was this, what was this thing called? Duck with purple sauce. Oh, duck and oyster. Peking yeah. duck, whatever. Yeah, Peking duck. Yeah, yeah that was all right. Yeah. Um, but now it's Japanese food. My daughter's favorite food is sushi. And when, when, whenever it's her birthday or whatever, we want to go to a sushi restaurant. No, they don't. <laughs> Dip bits of. I like that fishing. green stuff they have. That's nice. The wasabi, mm. which is basically just um, horseradish. It is. Um, yeah. But I can't like it. You like it. You like it. Yeah. I have two more questions oh, for do you. you. Yeah. I do. Um, how did you get into evolutionary psychology? How did I get into evolutionary psychology? I so I did did the old divinity degree, divinity, divinity doctorate, mm. and then I was um, doing lectures at, a, at the University of Erdogan every so often, mm. and so I had access to the library um, there before everything was on the internet, of course, go six. Mm. And I just started, I I just started going through, I well, I I think I was just I was al I was already I was writing things for a magazine called Right Now, mm. and I was aware of people like Richard Lynn and, and what they were saying. I, mm. I, I was able to kind of suppress it, I suppose, or whatever. Right. It was my interest to suppress. Mm. Uh, and and uh, and I thought, well, it's, their books were there in the library. Mm. Richard Lynn, uh, J. P. Rushton, mm. all this. And so so I started reading them. E. E. Wilson, mm. and I was like, wow. And, and I was writing this book about um, Finnish culture, mm. and I, did, I looked at it from a completely environmentalist perspective, mm. and I knew that there was something off about that. And then I realised, no, there's a genetic perspective to these things, and th this makes sense of things. And then suddenly, oh, and religion, and suddenly it made sense of everything very quickly. Yeah, we've been we've been denied uh, during my education the genetic perspective completely. Yeah. Uh, you'd had these terrible, bad environmentalist terrorist arguments, and everything suddenly made sense. Yeah. And so then, gradually, slowly, 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 as I was um, carving out a nascent career. At the time, I was working as a journalist, and then occasionally part as doing lectures at the university in the anthropology department. Yeah. Um, um, and then eventually, I, I, I was more more into more more understanding the importance of this. Mm. And then I got in touch with Richard Lynn, and this is about 2011. And then and then he gave me funding to start working for him and doing research on evolution. And so that's how that's how it happened. Is there any element of uh, modern academic evolutionary psychology that frustrates you at the moment? Um, well, yeah, there is a, there is a degree to anything anything that is um, powerful or that is has prestige mm. attracts the woke because okay. the woke like power and they like prestige. Mm. And so, on the one hand, the woke will say intelligence research is evil, shut down the journal Intelligence, shut down evolutionary psychology. Yeah. But on the other hand, they are attracted to it mm. because intelligence research is highly replicating mm. um, in a way that other research is not. Mm. Um, and evolutionary psychology is actually properly scientific and works mm. in a way that other areas like you know, uh, soft sciences do not. Mm. And so you have this problem where they are increasingly attracted to it. And so there are things that we have trouble now publishing in journals like Intelligence, which we didn't 10 years ago, mm. because slightly woker, cockier people have been, attra have, have, have been attra a younger generation really, <laughs> have been attracted into it. Yeah. So actually it's more difficult to get into, into prestigious journals, um, uh, evolutionary psychological, we could have got 10 years ago without any problem at all. 
and that's because because that it was a victim of its own success. Mm. Uh, precise, precisely because it's it's replicating and it's true, mm. then it attracts in people that want to in a, in a weird way are attracted to it for that reason, but also they need to virtue signal and suppress that very research which has got it prestigious in the first place. So that's frustrating. Um, and I guess another thing that's a little bit frustrating, perhaps, is that they're. The, in, if you in the humanities scholarship, you can just speculate till the cows come home. Okay. As, as long as long as you spend half your academic uh, study defining your terms mm. and all this crap. Mm. Um, whereas in these ones, you don't have to piss about saying uh, what do we mean by religion and all this. Mm. Uh, but you, do, you they won't let speculation. No, no. Show me the data or shut up. Um, and the, and there should be room, I think, for intelligent speculation. So perhaps that's slightly frustrating. I remember a thing in the last interview you said that. Uh famous public intellectual Thomas Sowell made some comments about IQ that were just wrong. Yeah. What was his assertion? No, he was just he was just doubting heritability and race differences and things like this. And, and I mean, he's, you know, I'm afraid everyone has blind spots, except yeah. me. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a, a scholar I know, he's very intelligent, but he has a complete blind spot when it comes to the, 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 his specific ethnic group. He yeah. doesn't like the research on that. Mm. Um, I know another, like, I know many of them like that, actually. Like, mm. I, I know a Zambian scholar who's great, but then he mm. has a blind spot with regard to that area, you know, mm. his own ethnic group or whatever. Mm. Um, uh, and so I'm afraid you, you just get people like that that have these certain blind spots that they have difficulty with. My uh, final question is, uh, is Europe salvageable? Yes. Uh, well, the problem that I have at the moment is that the a AI is, it's happened very fast and it's looking like it's going to be a new industrial revolution uh, in the same way that the internet was a kind of industrial revolution and even social media was, mm. but certainly the internet was. And, and what that does, what they seem to do, those revolutions, is they hollow out the middle. Mm. They push more middle people down into the bottom, mm. get rid of their jobs um, and a, 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 an intelligent group within the middle go into the top. Yeah. And, it, and so with the farming, with the, with the agricultural revolution, that's what it was, the death of the, the farm laborers, they mm. carried on. Mm. Big farms, they carried on. Mm. Small scale farmers, knocked out. Right. Um, and, the de the, the, and, and it's a similar thing that's going on. And, and so it, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's going to happen because of AI. There's all, I'm gonna, hoping to discuss it with a colleague this afternoon, actually, in more depth. Mm. But I think that there are probably, I think that if, Putting aside AI, yeah. I think that yeah, what wokeification is doing mm. is basically genetically selecting for in, indirectly mm. uh, for conservative, genetically conservative right wing people. And it's doing that among the more intelligent. We've got data on this the, mm. among the more intelligent, the big predictor of fertility is that you're conservative, that you're religious, that you're traditionalist. Yeah. Um, and, th and, and therefore, you will see a movement back to among the more intelligent. They tend to lead the culture mm. among people like towards people like that. Yeah. And those people will. Um, come together and they will hold out in certain parts of Europe mm. in the same way that at the moment in South Africa uh, the white minority are, whole, are basically creating a separate parallel society based around private security and things like that mm. um, and, and are holding out yeah. and so I think that now the question is where now I'm doing I'm doing research at the moment that indicates that intelligence is declining across Europe uh, but it's declining less in Eastern Europe mm. for various reasons. Mm. Even if you control for their poorer start in things like PISA, mm. it's control. It's declining less, probably because they industrialize later. Mm. Uh, this is even among the native population. Yeah. So I think that it may be that there would be a migration from west to east, mm. um, and and the the light of European civilization will be more in the east. Yeah. So that's made, but it's hard to say. I'm looking into it at the moment. It's an ongoing project. Fascinating. Um, Professor, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure to talk to you again. Yeah, it's my favourite interview, actually. Ladies and gents, uh, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Oh, where can they find you? So jollyheretic.com on Substack, where you can get stuff we don't put on YouTube and uh, in-person interviews and, um, yep, right. Um, I'm being told to look at the camera um, and, 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 and things like this. Um, and then a YouTube channel, uh, Jolly Heretic, and then Twitter, at Jolly Heretic, and then my books are all on Amazon. And then edwarddutton.com is where there's all my academic papers and my and my, my summaries of my book, so you can go there. So come and say hello. Wonderful. Thank you very much.